have shown favor to your people. You turned to your anger from us and lifted the cloud of guilt over us with the forgiveness of our sins. Help us again, God of guidance. Restore us anew, O Lord our Savior. Let us rejoice in you for aiding us to make a fresh start, a resurrection life. You have shown us your unfailing and steadfast love. You speak peace to your faithful servants, deliverance to those who fear you. May your glory dwell in our midst. Loving kindness and truth meet, peace and the righteousness embrace. Truth springs forth from the earth, and righteousness slips down from heaven. Our Lord gives goodness and beauty. May we respond with alms and thanksgiving. Honor goes before our Lord and prepares the way. Our
Good morning, everybody. So, the time for our young at heart. Who's feeling young at heart this morning? <laughs> when I was a child, one of our favorite things to do over Thanksgiving was to save the wishbone from the turkey and to let it air dry. Anybody familiar with that? Then we have to decide amongst our four siblings who would get to pull it and who might get the larger piece, thus receiving the blessing of making a wish. Now there were four of us in our household, so we would have to hold some kind of a competition to see who, which two of us could actually be the ones that might be a recipient of a wish that year. Could get a little testy at times. Any of you have a similar experience about having to share <laughs> who gets the wish? Well, I've given up the turkey bone, uh, but I still, after all these years, make a wish when I see a shooting star in the sky. Anyone else? Yeah. Have you ever wished for something? <coughs> Really, really wish for something. Because on the count of three, I want you to make a wish. Now, you don't have to say it out loud, because remember, if you tell another you wish, it doesn't come true. You ready? One, two, three. Everybody made a wish? Sometimes we make a wish without thinking about what would happen if our wish really came true. Have you ever planned a picnic or some kind of special outside event? And on the day as it approached, it rained? Kind of disheartening. And perhaps you sat and you watched the rain and you kind of grumbled to yourself and you said, oh, Wish it would just stop raining. But what if that wish had come true and it really stopped raining forever? Well, the consequences would be grave. There'd be no grass, no trees, no flowers. Our rivers, lakes, and streams would be nothing but dry sand pits, and all of life would begin to disappear. This world would be a pretty miserable place. Now, James and John were two brothers who were disciples of Jesus. And one day, the two of them came to Jesus and they said to him, Teacher, we want for you to do for us what we ask. Jesus looked at me and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they responded, in your glorious kingdom, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one at your right side and the other one at your left. You see, they most likely thought that Jesus was going to set up this earthly kingdom where he would be sitting on the throne, and they wanted to be on the throne with him on either side. They wanted to share in his glory and his greatness. But Jesus then says to them, you have no idea what you are asking. No idea what you are asking. And he explained to them that whoever wants to be great must be a servant of all. He said, for even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many now, I don't think that being a servant was exactly what James and John were wishing for, do you? Yeah. Sometimes you and I may say, I wish I could be more like Jesus. But is that real? Because if we really want that wish to come true, then we have to do something, don't we? We have to live as servants the way that Jesus lived as our servant. And we learn how to live as servants.
servant by learning more and more every day about Jesus, by reading what Jesus has to tell us in his holy scriptures, and by praying every day for Jesus to work in our hearts and to help us to become more like him. And trust me, it's a lifelong process. For only then can we be truly great and show God's love to the world. It's not always easy to become more like Jesus. Got a whole lifetime to work. Let us bow our heads and, and pray as we bring it out. Dear God, help us to mean it when we say, I wish I could be more like Jesus. And please show us each day how to become a greater servant to those around us. In Jesus' name. Thank you again to everyone who uh, mails in tithes and offerings, and uh, as per uh, usual, our offering plate is in the back of the sanctuary for those who choose to uh, provide gifts that day. So Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, and so let us follow his example and share all of our gifts, the gifts of our resources and our talents and our our practices and our worship, all of those gifts, so that we might also experience the joys and the challenges that come with serving. Please help me to offer a blessing over these gifts. Parent God, may this offering assist us in continuing Christ's work in the world to heal the grief, the transgressions, and illnesses that oppress and harm all of your creation. As we pray. Please join me in dark song. <laughs> It's a very strange feeling that I feel connected to a church but not be there every Sunday. Mm. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm recording, Bruce, so going on. <laughs> your conversation is going to be on there. all-pervasive and all-present. 
And we join this day to honor and to worship you, to be mindful of your covenant with us and our covenant to you. To love you with all our heart, mind, and soul. To love our neighbors as ourselves. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly in this world. We are mindful of Christ Jesus, our divine shepherd, that like sheep we go our own ways. And sometimes with our heads to the ground and our attentions turned elsewhere, we fail to heed the gentle nudge of your staff and your calls for home. With so many things to distract us, we work and school and family and recreation and the general business of life, we lie unresponsive to your calls to kingdom of service. We thank you, Jesus, our protector, for coming among us in order to shelter us from the cold of night and the force of danger. <clears throat> and in your presence, we are in green pastures. In you, we are forgiven and called once again to serve and to create with you a world of justice and peace for all. Lord God, we pray for our world, for the struggles and pain and turmoil that is raging because we have turned to self-reliance and individualism and complacency. Our lives are filled with struggles and suffering. Not a one of us are immune. And so we ask that you help us to do a better job in struggling together and helping one another along the way. Guide us in the ways of love and servitude that you have taught us. Fill us with your spirit so that we can love more unconditionally and practice more acceptance and tolerance of each other, especially for those who are different from us. Lord, give us voices that are bold and brave to speak out and to share your gospel message and the everlasting and enduring love that you have for us. Lord Jesus, we lift up those that we have named here this morning we ask for your divine healing, your courage and strength, your comfort and peace to be upon them, and speak to us about how we might participate in your love for them through our own servant. Jesus, I especially ask you this morning to be with our friend Dan in this particular time of his deep struggle and needs. We're sorry that. He's not here with us this weekend as planned, but you know the situation and the ways in which he is being challenged. We ask that you keep him safe and help him to know we will be well. Almighty God, I lift up your church today, the body of Christ. And I especially lift up this church here today. Breathe your Holy Spirit on its leaders, members, and friends, and help them now and in the future to bind together with holy cords of covenantal love, commitment, and service. These things I pray to you for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thessalonians. Oh, I forgot all about the hymn. Yes, I do have to do the hymn. This is 
one of my childhood favorites. Uh, how did I miss that? <laughs>
sanctify you through and through, and may your whole body, spirit, and soul be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. <clears throat> the title of my sermon this morning is called How Did You Get Here and Where Are You Going? Before I begin, I just ask, let me say, Dear God, thank you for calling me to this. Pastoral call here in Greenville and Rockwood and for the ministry that has occurred here. May these words of my last sermon here and the ponderings of each and every heart be good and holy in your ever abiding. Lord, our rock, and our Lord Jesus. Thank you. During my time here, in the past few years, I've met a lot of people from all walks of life. I've met people from many different places, many varied life experiences. And as most of you are aware, I'm a pretty social person generally. I ask a lot of questions. And I explore with an adventurous spirit. So one of the questions they often ask and have asked, had asked of me is, how did you get here? What brought you here? Some people find it hard to believe that someone would intentionally move to the northern regions of me. Now some of you have heard this story parts of this story, but I'm going to share it again because I think it's a good reminder to all of us to occasionally revisit the beginning of an unfolding plan. And for those who haven't heard this story, I hope that you're able to see and feel the stream of the Holy Spirit. So that's really why I'm sharing. So my cousin Nada, <clears throat> infamous Nada, was retired from the military living in upstate New York, and she'd never married. And while she had some siblings and extended family living near her, they had their own lives and their own struggles and issues and things to deal with every day of their lives. I was living alone in Oxford Bay here, and a recent empty nester pastoring in the same community and church for the past nine years. And Nate and I had lost con contact with each other as kids growing up because her family moved to New York and our family stayed in the old family homestead. And so one time she came to Maine to take care of some personal visit, business and she stopped in to visit her aunt and uncle whom happened to be my parents. And through that connection, we reconnected right away. We became fast and, and curious cousins, but more so as friends. We visited back and forth between New York and Maine for a few years, and Nada decided that she wanted to start looking for a vacation home here in Maine. And we looked at several places in the Casco and this field area, but because I had relatives here in the Moosehead Lake region, she mentioned that we should look up here. Now, to be truthful, I actually desired to look more south to something more climate temperate. But she insisted that uh, she couldn't do heat and humidity. We needed to come back. So we did. In case you don't know, my cousin usually gets what we get. <laughs> so <clears throat> we had my cousin who is a realtor help us to find places to look at and we came up here for a few days and stayed with one of my relatives 
And by that time, we had kind of thrown this all around and agreed that we would purchase this new venture together and that it would become our vacation home. And we had a whole lot of places lined up to look at with Amy Holy, who works here in the community, uh, from Monson to Shirley to Greenville to Rockford. And at the end of a very, very long day of looking at all of these various places, we were headed back from Rockford to Greenville, and I discovered a for sale sign on the lawn of this cute little white farmhouse. And I said, oh, let's stop. And she's like, no, I've seen all I can handle. No, no. I said, well, what's stopping in here? And I pulled a little paper out of the tube and we got back to my, my sister in law's. What's it up on the internet? So we got a hold of Amy and she was able to arrange for us the next morning to go look at this place before we had to head back to Oxford, New York. And fell in love immediately. There was no, you know, the night before we had spent going to every place we had looked at the pros and cons of deciding, okay, we had it narrowed down to two that we might make an offer on out of nine or ten places. But now we have a new process. Now it wasn't on our list originally because it had cost a little bit more money than we had originally said we wanted to pay. But we went up there. Immediately, she's standing on the steps going, oh, this is strange. She had not seen the house before. And so we went in, and they was like, geez, can we contain your excitement? You're supposed to be buying a house, and we don't want to know you're too excited about it. <laughs> and there. <laughs> anyway, it was hard to contain the joy and the excitement, and the anticipation. And so we drove back to Oxford because I had a busy church weekend. We had our Christmas annual Christmas fair coming up and, or something going on. And uh, so we're at the church Saturday, and she and I are And who should walk in but my cousin, the realtor. We said, okay, I want to make an offer. And she's like, really? Said, yeah. Well, which one of the... I said, oh, no, he's not going to do one while we were there. So I really lowballed the offer, and Nancy said, you know, we got to lowball, we got to do this right. We got to you know, leave room for plenty of negotiation. Well, <clears throat> we did have to go back and forth a couple of times, but we finally settled on this price. We bought the house. We're going to close in January 2008. We were so, so excited. Well, we came up to the property and I had done some research about different churches up here. And to backtrack just a tiny bit while we were out looking at houses, we actually went down the village where we were off and checked out the Kenya landing and discovered this little log cabin. You know, there's two women out in front of that cabin decorating the Christmas tree. Nancy Bear and Jimmy Sandler. And so they were more than anxious to tell us all about the log cabin and invite us to the Christmas program that was coming up in another week or two. And we're like, no, we're not going to be here then, but you know, we'll keep that in mind. Well, when our offer got accepted, and we were like, wow, a little chapel right down the hill from us, wouldn't that be cool? Close to home, nice place to. Be a part of the community already, and we were pretty excited. We researched where to come for worship on that vacation, and we ended up here at the Union Church because we had sent an email, and I think it was Elaine who answered the email, but we wanted to know about its welcoming, inclusiveness, and openness. And that was important to us. So we ended up here at this church, uh, and it happened to be annual meeting day. And I think it was Keith who said, you're welcome to stay for annual meeting and have a soup and bread with us after. Um, and so we stayed for the service and we stayed for uh, the meeting. Ann Curry, 
<clears throat> was the pastor and the chair of the pulpit that week. And she and I got into a quick conversation and she discovered that I too was a pastor. And we just sort of hit it off and started talking. We were going to make a lot of money off this vacation home. I want you to know we're going to rent it out and we were prime snowmobile season. Boy, we were going to break the fashion. But one problem after another happened. Hot water, and an oil push. We just had all these things, and I had to keep. She's in New York, and I had to keep coming back, like pretty frequently, to meet with service people and all of this stuff. So, needless to say, we never rented the place out once. We put a lot of money into it, haven't recaptured it. Yet. And then, as the spring, the winter continued, and spring began to unfold. Something began to unfold in me and became very unsettling and uncertain. And I, you know, wow, what's happening here? What's going on? And um, I finally came to understand that I was to explore the cause. Even though I had no real idea I was going to leave my church of 10 years, but I had asked an old pastor friend of mine years ago, well, how do you know when it's time to move on? And he said, oh, trust me, dear, you'll know. And as time went by, I did. I, I, I knew that God was shoving me, not nudging me now, he's shoving me. And so I called uh, Darren, who I knew from seminary. Uh, I knew his name, I didn't really know him. And, and I called him at the conference office and I said, okay, so, you know, what, what's with this? What can you tell me about the call? What can you tell me about um, the process I would need? I'm ordained Baptist, American Baptist, and the UCC church. And so he kind of talked me through. It happened that he was coming down to my area the following week for a council meeting uh, in the Norway area. And so he said, well, we'll meet in coffee and I'll bring you some material. So he did. And I did what he asked for paperwork and sent it in. And the next thing I knew, I was receiving a phone call uh, to tell me to search. Essentially, that's how I got here. On the breath and the wings of the Holy Spirit, answering the call by God, who in less than a year had orchestrated his plan for me as his servant. And by mid-October 2018, I was a full-time resident in Rockwood, Maine, preparing to begin my ministry here in this fall on November 1st. But if you remember correctly, I actually started early because a beloved church member had passed. And I received a call from Elaine saying, you don't have to do this. They needed pastoral support. And so I had to run running, and I've been running ever since. That's how I got here. And I'd like to just say that it's been an easy sail, no real storms to maneuver, but I can't because, as you all know, the COVID 19 pandemic happened. And I've learned to really appreciate. The lyrics in the refrain of the musical gift that Dan and I were to offer here today. And those lyrics go like this. <clears throat> and I'm going to try to sing it with a little bit of a tune. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You are alone on the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. Despite the pandemic and the many ways it's changed how we interact and how we minister to each other and how we worship together and all of that, there have been many blessings and gifts 
for me, and I pray for you as well. God has allowed me to use me. He has allowed, he has used me and allowed me to minister to many grieving families, not only here in these communities, but to those who lived away and brought their parents or their siblings back to be buried here in their hometown. God also was able to use my experience of losing my son both suddenly and tragically to be an authentic witness and presence and help in another family's time of losing their son suddenly and tragically. And while our circumstances were different, that grief and that profound love and emptiness and helplessness is all the same. So I thank God for those opportunities. I've done a few weddings since I've been here, and such a blessing to bring people together, just to be a part of that, them saying, yes, I commit to you. Yes, I want to spend my life with you. I love coming into the church on Tuesdays and Thursdays and being greeted with Miss Bonnie and the preschoolers. Their laughter and their energy and curiousness was a real refreshment to my soul each and every time I saw them. I had this one little boy last year, uh, year before last. He used to like make moon out of him. He never said a word to me all school year long, but every time I came in, he I loved poking my head into the thrift shop, getting to know some of the community volunteers who helped our church from the outside, realizing that if we but just ask, people are willing and ready and prepared to respond. And some thought Nader and I were pretty crazy when we dressed up for Halloween and stood out by our decorated lawn garden. Thank you, Pat, for your hard work on the gardens. And we stood in the cold drizzle, passing out candy and meeting new families as they passed by. Oh, and our St. Patrick's Day festival for the kids, cabbage rolls and all of those things. Thank you, Diane Bartley, for the cookies and the icing so that the kids could decorate and create their own cookie creations and for those who stayed and helped them. In our May Day festival, where we created May baskets and talked about pagan rituals that have become symbols of our Easter Holy Week. And then we delivered one large basket to the staff and nursing home residents. And Mildred and Avis joined us dancing around the facility, singing, This is the Day. The impromptu conversations in my office and popping his head in every time he would deliver the mail just to say, hi, how are you doing today? The time spent in the village, the ministry in that historic church. The collective Moosehead Choir. Thank you, George Reese, for your dedication every week to drive up here from Stoneham, Maine to help lead us in rehearsals and concerts. So many wonderful, wonderful memories and blessings in three short years that I've only just covered the very top surface. And now comes the next question. So where are you going? Do you remember the final episode in Nash, that goodbye, farewell, and Armen? Anybody watched that? They were located three miles from the front lines of the war zone, and amid the horrors of war wounded soldiers and sniper bullets, bombs, and incompetent army guidelines, the doctors and the nurses relied on their humor, their hijinks, and their hearts of compassion to help keep them sane. And through their common experience, the members of the 4077 became a close knit family and community. And in that episode, the community finally receives that long-awaited good news, the war is over, and they can go home to be with their families and their friends. 
and it was a cause for great joyful celebration and for sad goodbyes. But the doctors and the nurses soon realized that going home meant that their current relationships would end as they depart for various destinations and lives in the United States. The person who struggled with this inevitable change the most was surgeon B.J. Honeycutt. B.J. doesn't want to say those two short and simple words, goodbye. For him, it carries just too much of a heavy weight of finality, and, and who can blame B.J. for feeling and acting this way? Saying goodbye to a friend or a mentor or a pastor who's leaving can be very difficult. Once the words are spoken, the person then has to learn how to live without each other in their day and in their communal life. And that type of change can be kind of scary and unsettling and stressful. And so for us today, we may be feeling some or many of those same feelings that E.J. Honeycutt felt. I'm leaving this very afternoon for a new life in Farmington, a new living arrangement, a new director's job. I don't know anybody there yet. And still, the promises and the instructions of our Lord are the same for me as they are for you. As you face a new future as a church family, and you transition yet again into the unknown world. You know, the scriptures, part of the scripture reading that went around me, um, Jesus has announced his imminent departure, leaving his disciples very anxious and distressed. The blow of this announcement, however, is softened by his extraordinary words of assurance and promise. And the disciples, they're not going to be abandoned or left to fend for themselves because Jesus says that after his return to God, the Holy Spirit will be sent in his name and will accompany them in their continued life and mission in this world. And the teaching role of the paraclete or the Holy Spirit is to pass on the tradition of what Jesus said and did without corruption, and also to reveal the mind of Christ in new situations. And then remember these parting words of Paul as he addresses the church in Thessalonica. We appeal to you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and to have charge of you and the Lord and admonish you and esteem them kindly in love because of your love. Be at peace among yourselves and I urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faith hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them, see that no one repays evil evil, but that you seek always to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for that in Jesus' name we pray, Christ Jesus, for each and every one of us. Don't quench the spirit, don't despise the words of the prophet. Test and hold fast to what is good, abstain from evil, and may the God of Self sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be kept firm and blameless. The coming of our Lord Jesus. So, as I prepare to depart, I ask, hold fast to those farewell words of Paul. Hold fast to the story of how I got here on the wings of the breath of the Holy Spirit. The many wonderful things that we shared as blessings in these three years. The final message of Paul's letter beautifully describes what it means to be a follower of Christ in a life that is full of so much change. 
Being a follower of Christ is about loving others and encouraging the faithful and helping the weak, being patient, avoiding vengeance. It's about rejoicing and praying and thanksgiving to God for all that God has done for us. For we do not know in our suffering what good will come from. It's all about making room for the Spirit to flow and to carry us on paths that fulfill God's vision, God's unfolding plan. It's about constantly moving forward in love to witness the ever changing, ever redeeming, ever reforming, and ever reshaping kingdom of God that is established by God for all of creation. And so, as God's the ambassador for love, we grow and we stretch. We reach out our hands and our feet and our arms and our legs and our hearts and our bodies to Christ and his to do the things that God intends for us to do. In recent weeks, I've seen traces of God be with you, glimmer through the various ways in which members have shared their God. Members and friends. From tearful and heartfelt conversations to emails and cards and even in silence. And it's those simple and powerful acts of divine that remind me of God's wondrous presence in our lives over these past few years. Those glimmering traces of God's presence that have helped to hopefully make me a better person better mother to my children, better pastor to those whom I will now be pastoring in this long-term care home, and hopefully, too, as a Christ follower. Those glimmering traces of God's presence have shaped and will continue to shape all of you as much as they have me to be loving and passionate people that God calls us to be. And while there's no guarantee that any of us will ever see each other again, I do believe that the glimmering traces of God's presence will forever connect, forever illuminate the separate paths that we travel to do the work of Christ. And above all, I just hope that you'll remember that I do love and care for each of you. And I will be praying. For a fruitful and a glorious ministry for you and by you. And so God be with you. And it has come to the um, time in the service this morning for us to say our goodbyes. Our church family is constantly changing. People come and go. Babies are born. Children grow. People commit themselves to one another. Loved ones and friends among us come to the end of their lives. Individuals move into our community and church life. Others leave us, moving away to new places new experiences, and new opportunities. It is important in life that we recognize these times of passage, of endings and beginnings. Today we share the time of farewell with our pastor, who is leaving us for new adventures and ministry. Denise, would you come forward, please? On November 1st, 2018, this local church called Reverend Jenny Stern to serve as our pastor. And I thank <clears throat> Union Evangelical, its members and friends for the love and kindness and support shown to me over these last three years. 
grateful for the ways in which my leadership has been accepted and asking for forgiveness for the mistakes that I have made here. And as I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned. And ask you to your influence on our faith and faithfulness will not be with us today with our heart. I forgive you and I accept your gratitude, trusting that our time together and our part will be pleasing to God. I ask that you see that. You, the members and friends of the Navy Democratic Health Committee, reverently return. And the duties of pastor and minister. You do offer your encouragement for her ministry as it unfolds in new ways. We offer prayers to the Lord. You may be seated. You, Denise, release the Southern Church from turning to you and depending on you to do what you talk about. You offer encouragement for the continued ministry here and on the relationship with one another who will come to church, we offer one prayer to the Lord. At this time, I ask that the members of the church council in attendance please come forward. On behalf of the main conference of the United Church of Christ and the Katahdin Association, I witness to the words spoken, words of thankfulness, forgiveness, and release. The member churches of our association and conference hold each of you in prayer. We pledge our support in the transition signified in this service. And thanks be to God. Let us all pray. God, God who is everlasting love for all of us, authentic and trustworthy, help each of us to hold confidence in the new future ahead, which rests in your care. We give thanks for remembering times when in your name we have shared the life of faith together. Our laughter and tears, our hopes and disappointments, our strengths and weaknesses. We can thank you for the moments shared in worship, in learning, and in service. Guide us as we hold these memories, but also as we move in new directions. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We bid farewell and we launch beginnings with the blessing of God. We continue our journey as it has been boldly following Jesus, following the footsteps of the one we look to as teacher and redeemer. And we go with the companionship of the Holy Spirit who guards and guides and gifts the church and each soul in it. We go in hope and in faith and in love, trusting that God is with us, guiding, gifting, guarding, sustaining, leading, and blessing. We raise this blessing in the name of Jesus, whom we boldly follow. Amen. At this time, um, I would like to offer to Denise that thing. Um, we have a gift for you from the church, Denise. Um, dear Denise, a donation in your name will be made to the Central Church in appreciation for your ministerial service to the Union. Thank you. From the also like to offer the flowers and offer for being thanks for your being here and 
At this point, we would like to uh, sing our closing hymn, Thanks to God for My Redeemer. It's number 571. <laughs>
We're no longer recording, so you can speak. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. I'll be in touch. Thank you, Diane. I love you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had...